This is the city, Los Angeles, California. More than 50,000 people fly in and out of here every day. Los Angeles International is one of the busiest airports in the country. Planes from all over the world touch down here daily, but airplanes didn't always look the same. Los Angeles played host to the first international air meet held in the United States. That was January of 1910. It was quite a display. In this small dirigible, the pilot had to walk to the tail to make it rise. A short 10 years later, Donald Douglas was finishing the Cloudster in back of a Santa Monica barber shop. This plane launched the aircraft industry in Los Angeles. Many of the large aerospace firms are direct descendants of the airplane building companies that took root here in the early 30s. Today, the aerospace industry is a major source of employment. Almost 300,000 men and women work in these plants. The industry, with its constantly changing technology, remains a magnet to those seeking worthwhile employment. Sometimes people seek employment outside the law. When they do, I try to stop them. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Monday, October 13th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile narcotics section. The boss is Captain Roger Gindon. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. At 12.30 p.m., we arrived at Central Receiving Hospital. We had a 12-year-old boy that we'd found wandering across a busy Los Angeles freeway. It appeared that the child had been rendered unconscious by an overdose of narcotics. What's the word, Doc? He's asleep, but not permanently. We pumped his stomach, got his blood pressure stabilized, and respiration is good. Barring the unexpected, he'll make it. What'd the boy drop? Barbs? I'll have to wait for a lab report, but the reaction's all there. I'd say barbs were a good bet. Figures. Any possibility of brain damage? With an overdose of sedatives, there's always a possibility. In this case, though, I think we got him in time. When can we see him, Doc? In about 24 hours, he might be able to tell you his name. Or do you know it? Yes, sir. When we picked him up, he was dazed, but he was still rational. His name's Kenneth Shore, age 12. 12 years old. From diapers to drugs. What's next? Prenatal goofballs? We located the parents. They're on the way down. Glad to hear it. Let me know when they arrive. Ought to be here any minute. Good. I want to have a talk with them. So do we. We sent a few of the capsules found on the shore boy to SID for lab analysis. 1.30 p.m., Thomas Shore, the victim's father, operated a small service station and garage in East Los Angeles. After the parents had seen their son and talked with the doctor, we interviewed them in a vacant room at Central Receiving. It's not like the doctor thinks it is at all. We're very close to Kenneth. He's loved and he knows it. He's right, Sergeant. We're as close to that boy as we know how. It's that new school. I know it. He made new friends, not like the old ones. He wouldn't even tell us their names. He hasn't been the same boy. How's he different, Miss Shaw? He's independent, I guess. Tom said he was growing up and, and now he... <laughs> Everything will be all right, dear. Believe me. I'm sorry. I just just can't help it. Who in his right mind would give drugs like that to a 12-year-old boy? A lot of people, Mr. Shore. Criminals, thieves, addicts, sometimes a parent or an older brother. Sure, and when you catch them, what happens? A bunch of overage and grade judges turn them loose because you don't kiss them before you run them in. 
A nice slap on the wrist and they're back out on the streets. Never mind the kids' rights. The rights belong to the crumbs. Oh, don't, don't get angry. I know it's painful for you, but there's something you both should see. Now, when we picked your boy up on the freeway, this is what he had in his pockets. Those capsules. Is that what Kenneth... Yes, ma'am, we think so. It's second all. Our lab is running a test now. The doctor said you found some marijuana in Kenny's pocket. Is that it? That cigarette butt? Yes, sir. Dear God in heaven. Went the route, didn't he? Looks that way, doesn't it? I don't understand. The doctor said second all was a depressant, a sleeping pill. Kenny's always such a goer. Why would he take sleeping pills? Second all acts like sleeping pills. If you take it, then lie down and relax. If you don't, if you stay on your feet, second all can affect a person like alcohol does. There's a feeling of exhilaration. That's what the kids are looking for. Only Ken probably got impatient. What do you mean? Well, a kid pops a couple of pills and nothing happens, so he swallows a couple more. Ten or 15 minutes later, he feels a little buzz. Suddenly, he's a real big man, like the guy who's had a few drinks. He feels brave. Things begin to groove. So he pops a couple more. Before he knows it, he's taken too much. He passes out. Now, unless he gets medical attention immediately, he rarely regains consciousness. Ken got lucky. What's that paper? It's from his school. It's an examination paper. Kenny's? Yes, ma'am. It's marked 100%. I'll get a doctor. Two thirty p.m. While a doctor administered to Mrs. Shore, I called the SID lab and talked with a technician, Don Hale. Bad news, huh? Yes, sir. Those capsules contain cecobarbital. Well, what happens now? As soon as your boy recovers, we'll want to get together with the three of you for counseling. You know, kids are sharp. As a rule, when they know the truth about something, they'll generally make the right decision. Sometimes that even works with adults. <laughs> when you're ready to try, let me know. How's your wife, Mr. Shore? She feel any better? Yeah. She's madder than a wet hen, though. That's so. Mad at who? The doctor. He tried to give her a sedative. <laughs> At 2.45 p.m., we returned to the office to file our report. I called the Harrison Junior High School, where Kenneth Shore was a student, and I talked with the boys' vice principal, Mr. Lee Daniels. He asked us to meet him in his office. At 4.10 p.m., we drove to Harrison Junior High in East Los Angeles. Which one of my boys has been blowing pot? What makes you think it's pot, Mr. Daniels? Pills, then, and I'm not the least bit psychic. It just happens that I work in a junior high school. It's Kenneth Shore, Mr. Daniels. Kenneth Shore? Well, Ken was absent today. I called his home this afternoon. We couldn't raise anyone. What's he been up to? The boy's in Central Receiving Hospital from an overdose of second all. His condition is critical. Oh, no. Ken? We'd like a list of his friends, Mr. Daniels, or the people he thinks are his friends. Sorry, gentlemen. Maybe I can talk to his teachers and get you a list, but Ken's only been here about a month. He's a seventh grader. I've got a couple of hundred of them. We understand, sir. Not only that, I've got a bunch of new teachers. They're the ones I'd like to see educated about the drug scene in our junior high schools. A few dig what's going on, but most of them don't. Some wouldn't even know pot from potato peelings. One or two don't even care. It's the same with the pills. The majority wouldn't know a goofball from a cantaloupe. I need someone to teach my teachers. Any volunteers? Yes, sir. Our entire staff. Beg your pardon? Narcotics Division, our teacher's awareness program for drug abuse on campus. Yours for the asking, complete with lecture, slides, practical demonstrations. We're ready to help, Mr. Daniels, any time. Any time? Yes, sir, any time. I've got a teacher's meeting at 7.30 this evening. Can you be there? Yes, sir, we'll be there. Is she dead? No, ma'am, not yet. This picture was taken at 10 p.m. The girl lived until midnight. Why is she lying on the floor? The officers were waiting for an ambulance. Now, overdose victims are subject to convulsions. Unlike a bed, they can't fall off a floor. All right, Bill, I wonder if we could have the lights, please. Right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I pointed out earlier, it's not our intention to try and make policemen out of school teachers. But perhaps if only one person in this room had taken the time to talk to Kenneth Shore about the dangers of depressant drugs, he might not be in a hospital tonight fighting for his life. Now, that's what our teacher's awareness program is all about. I'm a little puzzled, Sergeant. I thought marijuana was the big problem, not pills. 
Well, sir, they're both big, and they're both serious. Two years ago, for example, approximately 80% of the arrests made by our juvenile narcotics unit were for marijuana offenses. The other 20% was charged with illegal use of barbiturates, amphetamines, LSD, and heroin. Last year, there was actually a small decline in the use of marijuana among juveniles. On the other hand, arrests for the illegal use of amphetamines and barbiturates jumped 247%. Is that so? Yes, sir, and we don't like the trend. Bill? I might add, sir, that total arrests of juveniles on all charges jumped 55% last year from the year before. Pep pills and goofballs were largely responsible. I've always wondered, what's the difference between a pep pill and a goofball? Pep pills are amphetamine sulfates, like this row here. Benzedrine, known as Benny's or White's, is the most common. Others are Dexedrine and Dexamil. The kids call them Dexies. They're exactly what the name implies, pep pills. They're rough on the body. They cause hyperactivity, intoxication, sleeplessness, reckless behavior. They speed up the pulse rate and cause distortion in time and space perception. Goofballs or barbiturates are depressant hypnotic drugs. Nembutol, known as yellow jackets. Secobarbital, commonly known as secanol or red devils. Tuanol, known as rainbows. And amatol. The kids call them bluebirds. They're sleeping pills, but depending on how they're used, they cause intoxication, stupor, euphoria, false bravery, tremendous distortion in time and space perception. Heavy use can cause the most serious type of addiction. An overdose may cause death. Any questions? Granted, uh, you've made your case against speed, LSD, heroin, and those ghastly looking pills. But I maintain the evidence against marijuana isn't in yet. Well, sir, will you concede that it might be as harmful as alcohol? Well, all right, but it's no worse. No, sir, I hope not. Because according to US government figures, between five and six million people in this country are physically and mentally sick as a result of their use of alcohol. The National Safety Council estimates that on the highways, liquor-caused property damage amounts to over $4 billion annually. As long ago as 1965, a year that incidentally was carefully researched, 29,400 Americans died on the highways in alcohol-related accidents. Now, I think it's safe to assume that figure is even larger today. Now, let me ask you, if marijuana possesses only half the potential of alcohol for violence, criminality, accidents, and social degradation, do we need pot? Any other observations you'd like to make, Professor? I strike my colors. You promised us a demonstration, gentlemen. I want everyone here to know exactly how marijuana smells. Yes, sir. Bill, do you want to take over? Marijuana, scientific name, cannabis sativa. It's a member of the hemp family. Grows as a shrub-like plant that may attain a height of 20 feet. This, incidentally, is not the real thing. This is a demonstration kit prepared and distributed by a nationally known drug firm. Maybe you'd like to pass this around. Now, as you can see there, the marijuana leaf always contains an odd number of divisions, or leaflets, from 5 to 13. The real leaf is sticky to the touch. The sticky substance is cannabinol, which is the actual narcotic resin in the plant. The other item in the demonstration kit is an ersatz marijuana pellet. Now, we'll place it here in the ashtray, set the pellet on fire. Burning pot has a distinctive odor. Some people have described it as sweet or sickly. Would you all like to step forward? Now, some say the odor is similar to burning rope, alfalfa, or weeds. It smells terrible. Yes, ma'am. This is what marijuana smells like. I can guarantee it. I should have spoken to you about it, but I wasn't sure. What's the matter, Mrs. Rogers? I smelled it before, just this morning. Where? In the girls' restroom. Tuesday, 8.30 a.m., I checked with Central Receiving Hospital. Kenneth Shore, the overdose victim, had been transferred to the county medical hospital and was holding his own. He was not allowed visitors. 8.45 a.m., we got a call from the boys' vice principal at Harrison Junior High School. He said there'd been trouble. Daniels asked us to come right over. You got here in a hurry. What's the problem? A little beef between a teacher, Mrs. Rogers, and one of my seventh graders. You met Mrs. Rogers last night. Yes, sir. The boy's name is Frederick Pine. You want to tell us about it? Freddie's first class today was with Mrs. Rogers. 
The boy came in singing at the top of his voice. Mrs. Rogers asked him to stop. He refused. He got louder and louder. When Mrs. Rogers insisted that he sit down and be quiet, Freddie blew his top. Is the boy normally hot-tempered? Not at all. And he worships Mrs. Rogers. All right, what happened then? Well, Mrs. Rogers grabbed Freddie by the arms and tried to put him in his seat. The kid broke away and started swinging. He struck Mrs. Rogers three or four times in the face. It took three other boys to put him down. By the time I got there, Freddie was singing again, quietly. I searched him. I found this. Marijuana. That's what I thought. He had these cigarette papers in his shirt pocket. Looks like young Freddie Pine's got himself a good connection. What, did I make a mistake? How? Well, when I went through the boys' pockets. I suppose now I'll be in trouble for making an illegal search and seizure. Not at all, sir. Really? I thought they had restrictions nowadays. Those court decisions I keep reading about. Yes, sir, but the restrictions apply to us, not to you. As a teacher or administrator, any contraband you confiscate from a student can be legally admitted as court evidence, as long as you're not working as an agent for the police. I work for one thing, the welfare of the kids in this school. Yes, sir, we understand. And that includes Freddie Pine. a.m., Frederick Pine readily admitted having smoked marijuana on the way to school that morning. He announced proudly that he'd rolled the joint himself. The boy's parents, Dr. and Mrs. Frederick Pine, arrived at the school. Dr. Pine, an East Los Angeles dentist, took over the interrogation. Now, you hear me, son, and you hear me good. Where'd you get the stuff? Who gave you the grass? Ain't nobody gives you grass. All right, who sold it to you? Now, answer me. I'm tired of fooling with you. I've had it, huh? Oh, you've had it like you wouldn't believe. Okay. Okay what? Okay, I'm copping out. Good, we're waiting to hear you. Tim sold it to me. Who's Tim? He's a big guy in the ninth grade. Don't ask me his last name. Why not? I forgot it, that's why. Tim Freeman, is that who you mean? Yes, sir. Freeman, that's it. All right, now think now, Freddy. Did Tim ever offer to sell you any pills? Sure, I couldn't afford them. Did Kenneth Shore buy some? Why are you asking me that? Never mind asking why. Just answer the question. Do I have to? Come on. How about it, pal? Did Ken ever buy pills from Tim Freeman? Sure. He bought a whole slew of them. 10.55 a.m., we asked Dr. and Mrs. Pine to wait with their son in the registrar's office while Mr. Daniels, Bill, and I went to find Timothy Freeman. The Freeman boy had a history class scheduled at 11 a.m. He was taken into custody outside the classroom. 11.15 a.m., Bill and I interviewed Timothy Freeman in the boy's vice principal's office. We advised him of his rights and asked him to empty everything out of his pockets onto the desk. Come on, boy, give. You shook me down once and I didn't have no gun. Now what do you want? Give. My old man will kill me. This what you're looking for? Reds, whites, and rainbows. All right, Tim, where'd you get them? I told you. Your father? You figure it out. Where does your father get them? What's his connection? I don't know. Honest, I don't know. Come on, son, let me ask you this. Did you sell some pills like these to Kenneth Shore? Maybe, maybe not. Come on, boy, yes or no? Is Ken dead? No, he's not dead. Why? You're lying. I heard it at school. No, we're not lying, son. You mean it? Of course we mean it. Oh, I'm so glad. I thought I killed him. 12.15 p.m., we continued to question young Tim Freeman. The boy said he lived with his parents and an 18-year-old sister in a large house on Cannon Street, eight blocks from Harrison Junior High School. In addition to the Freemans, the house was occupied by four unmarried adults and two small children. How long have you been blowing pot, son? I don't know, a couple of years. This picture, who is it? My sister, Mary. She's my best friend, too. Real pretty, isn't she? All right, Tim. Who turns you on, the grass and the pills? My old man. He says pot won't hurt anybody. What's he say about pills? If it's your bag, there ain't nothing wrong with it. Just don't get too high. Where do you think your dad learned about drugs? I don't know. Mexico, maybe. Tijuana? Yeah, TJ's a swinging town. You ever been there? Me? No. How about your dad? Does he go there often? Yeah. How often does he go to Tijuana? Every weekend. Why? took the two boys to Georgia Street Juvenile and booked them on Section 602 WIC. Frederick Pine was released to the custody of his parents. Timothy Freeman was detained in Juvenile Hall. 
6 p.m., we obtained a search warrant, plus warrants for the arrests of all adults living at 1712 East Cannon Street, the Freeman residence. Police officers, we have a warrant for the arrest of David Freeman. David! The fuck? Gene, the stairs! Yeah. for the timber. Pigs, you're all pigs. You'll be sorry for this. What are you doing to my kids? I love my kids. From the looks of this place, it shows. Easy, man. Maids stay off. All right, Gil, hold them here. Green, 3L21, you call for transportation? Stick around, we may have a crowd for you. We already got one green in the kitchen. Right. Mr. and Mrs. David Freeman. You give them their rights? Yeah, I found them at the top of the stairs trying to flush two kilos of grass down the toilet. Anybody else up there? I'll check. There's about a dozen rooms. This is an outrage. I run a respectable boarding house. That's so. Where's your license? I'll get it first thing tomorrow. Now get out of here, all of you. Not a chance, Freeman. Is that what this is all about? A lousy license? You got a daughter. Where Never is she? mind our daughter. What's all this fuss about a crummy license? Joe. Yeah. We'll need the coroner. Jean DeCrona found the body of Mary Freeman, Tim's sister, in a third floor room. The girl had been dead for several hours from an overdose of barbiturates. I told her a hundred times, be careful, baby. Don't get too high. She just wouldn't listen to me. Oh, she listened to you, Freeman. She did. That was her trouble. just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 26th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty on three counts of furnishing to minors, possession of illegal drugs and narcotics, and with contributing to accidental death. The suspect was found guilty of possession of marijuana and with contributing to accidental death. All other adult persons living in the Freeman residence were found guilty of furnishing to minors. Timothy Freeman was placed on probation for a period of one year. He, along with the two illegitimate children found living in the Freeman residence, were made wards of the court and placed in foster homes. Mm -hmm. 